now I tell am. us. Are you fine? Yes. Okay, so guys, um, <clears throat> this is when the chemistry gets fun because now we're starting to talk about the atom. We're gonna start talking about how they match up together. We're gonna start reading the periodic table. So in order to understand that um, the atom, you know, is composed of protons, neutrons, electrons, electrons go around the nucleus, you have to understand the history behind it. Like where did it come from? So that's what these slides are all about. Um, just so you know, write down in your planner that my planner's under the key. <laughs> well, you're gonna you're gonna write it later, but you're gonna have a quiz um, a week from Monday. It's up on the board and it'll be saved there. So if you're not in class right now, make sure you write that down. The 14th on Monday, um, the 14th, December 14th, you're gonna have a matching quiz, which sounds really easy, but could you know confuse you. So you got to do a little bit of studying, and it's gonna be on the scientists. It's gonna be on alchemy um, and quarks oh, right. and alpha particles. So, so you'll see. Matching quiz. Matching quiz. I just science quiz. I'm from uh, four point one notes. Oh, okay. okay, so we know that atoms do exist now, but we need to go back in time and figure out like how did they even come into people's thoughts. We know that they're building blocks of matter, but we gotta go back to the day where it started primitively. If you look, is that all on the screen? If you look at these, um, yes. if you look at these um, drawings right here, you got the primitive drawing from BC, and you see it's it's very simple. There's not a lot of uh, detail. Then um, you know, fast forward 2,000 years, we get um, still a simplified version, but you see hooks here. That's going to imply bonding and compounds being formed. Then 100 more years, we get into Thompson's um, plum pudding model. And so we'll explain so that plum uh, the week that, uh, next week. Then we get into the Bohr model, which is like a Jimmy Neutron atom where the electrons are going around the nucleus. Yep. Why is that one called plum pudding? Oh, uh, you'll find out. But this is Thompson Rutherford age, and that's going to be the video you're watching this weekend. Uh, plum pudding because he was British, and he said the electrons were like raisins in a plum pudding, or plums, in, in this plum pudding, and he just gave it that kind of name because okay. he made a model. He had this idea that the atom looked like this when he was eating breakfast one day. <laughs> Question. I was that smart, just figured it yeah, out. Yeah, right? Should we draw those circle things over? This, no, but this is just showing you that, I mean, you could them. move oh. that out of the way. It just shows you that the electrons going around the nucleus, and that's how it advanced even more. And a lot of people, a lot of, of you guys kind of associate that with the Jimmy Neutron, mm -hmm. Adam. The Bohr model, Niels Bohr is the one that came up with his model. This is what your atom model is gonna look like when we start the project. So it's like definite rings where the electrons are located. So there's a couple of models in the back of the room where the electrons are in definite rings around the nucleus. But that that's so not cool. actually the way that it looks now because the technology keeps advancing. So this is called the cloud theory, where the electrons aren't in specific rings, they're not in definite paths, they're actually in probability clouds. So it starts getting more and more complicated. And I don't even believe that this is going to be, you know, I don't think this is gonna remain the current theory, it's just gonna get more and more advanced as technology just gets more advanced, right? So we're gonna start from the beginning, the primitive time. Uh, we're gonna follow the scientists, how they contributed to the theory, and see how it just kept evolving. So we're gonna start here, um, and that's gotta be on the video. So here's a video within a video. People in the ancient times thought about elements. Aristotle, a Greek philosopher who lived more than 2,000 years ago, taught that only four elements were used in various combinations to make everything in the universe. He identified these elements as earth, fire, air, and water. To illustrate his point, he used this famous example. When a piece of wood burns, you can see the fire escaping from it as flames. The air from within the wood escapes as smoke. When the wood has been completely burned, the ashes that are left represent the earth. So wood is made of fire, air, and earth. To people living at the time, this made very good sense, and Aristotle's ideas about the four elements of matter were widely accepted. One Greek thinker believed differently than Aristotle. Democritus taught his students that matter was made up of small particles he called atoms, which he derived from the Greek word atomus, which means cannot be divided. 
He explained that if a loaf of bread were broken into pieces, even the smallest crumbs we can see are still bread. But if you could continue to divide the bread into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually you would have to stop when you had only one atom of bread. That atom could not be further divided. Democritus's ideas were rather close to what is now thought to be true about matter. But for 2,000 years after his death, people continued to believe in the four elements that Aristotle proposed. Okay, so that kind of shows you uh, the differences in beliefs back then. Um, but just to reiterate, Democritus was the one that said you could take a substance like that loaf of bread and you keep cutting it and cutting it and cutting it, and you're going to eventually end up with bread atoms that are uncuttable. So what I would write in your notes is that Democritus, under Democritus, say if you already wrote uncuttable, he believed in an uncuttable particle. He called that a tamos. But another word you might want to write down is an indivisible particle. An indivisible particle, I-N-D-I-V. Indivisible particle, meaning it can't be divided anymore. So Democritus believed that atoms do exist, they make up all substances, and they are the particle that you can't break down anymore. What do you think? Do we still believe that, or can we break atoms down now? No. What's inside of an atom, do we know? No. Electrons. Electrons and, electrons and, electrons and neutrons. neutrons. Neutrons and? Protons. Protons. Whoa. And let me throw you, let me blow your mind a little bit more. Inside protons, there's stuff too. Quarks are inside protons quarks. and neutrons. Like wine quarks? Not like wine corks. <laughs> quarks, like quack like a duck. Q U A R K. Oh, like the like the rock. Kind of? No, that's quartz with a Z. Oh. <laughs> um, quark, <laughs> quarks. So ask your parents what a quark is and see if they know. Now, I never studied quarks when I was in school, but they were actually discovered in the 50s. So, um, but it, it's not really covered unless you get into like higher levels of physics, but we're starting to see them, that word introduced more in the younger textbooks, like the lower level textbooks now, yeah. Do you think that's why they call them Jimmy Neutron? Because like they had the atom at the beginning and then his last name was Neutron? Yes, that is why, because it all has to do with <laughs> atoms, right. So, <laughs> Democritus, which I think is pretty cute. Oh yeah, thanks. Right, Kaylee? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Anyway, um, Greek philosopher, he was older than Aristotle, and he said you're going to have this uncuttable particle or an indivisible, meaning I can't divide it anymore, particle, and he called it a tamos. We changed the name to the atom. So let's talk about Wait, how he, he was alive at, before. Before, yep. There was only like a 10-year overlap, so Aristotle was like 10 or 14 years old when Democritus died. And remember, these aren't exact dates. But but the way that the timeline is, Democritus was first, and then Aristotle Wait, came. So we should be so much smarter now because we're fourteen. And yeah, <laughs> right. Genius fourteen year old. Jeez, right? Aristotle's putting way too much pressure on Democritus. Us. If you're in Latin, I got some information from some Latin mm -hmm. teachers. Democritus studied under Her um, Heraclitus, <laughs> and Heraclitus yeah. believed that everything is in a state of flux. What do you think flux. that means? Like moving. moving. Everything is moving in a state of flux. And his famous quote is, you never step in a river twice. What's that mean? What? You'll you get too wet. It's a, now you yeah. get too wet. It's the same every time? You step in a river and you, you never step in it twice. Oh, you never. It's always different. That? Because oh, it's always moving. It's, it's moving. So you're like, oh. you step in like oh. one part and then it like moves away and then you step in a different part. That's right. like when you pee in a river, it just keeps going. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Daphne. Like when you pee in a river, it keeps going. <laughs> All right, so anyway. She's um, forever. <laughs> <laughs> we will put this on YouTube. We'll put it on a private channel. Okay, here we go. So, Democritus is very, you know, he's a good observer. He didn't, you know, he didn't have a lot of the technology. He didn't have the research. Like, he was, remember I said he was the library. He, he was the one that was figuring all these things out. Um, you know, I talked about this in the video, how he said, you know, fires made of fire atoms and they're spiky because they hurt my hand and water atoms so are So he smooth. had to touch fire. Well, he, like, he just stuck kind of. Fire. Yeah, kind oh, of. Like, um, he would say things do. like, since he said that there were small hard particles made of a single substance. So he said water <clears throat> is made up of all water atoms and they're fairly small. But trees, okay, trees are made up of tree, tree. atoms and, and they're probably pretty big, right? 
And clouds are made of cloud atoms. And what do you think? Big? Pretty probably. Small. probably yeah. I don't, I don't no. Clouds, you see a cloud, it's pretty I big. I think they're like medium size. Medium yeah. size, yeah. but are they spiky? Are no, they like they're soft. 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 Yeah, so like he's, this is how he's thinking, right? Small heart particles, oh, single yeah, substance. I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. He says they make different shapes and sizes. Why would he say that? Because they feel different things. Like well, they like, no, like, like because a tree is much bigger than uh, maybe a little fire. It's like tree atoms make trees, and that's different from cloud atoms that make clouds. Right? Wait, so then if he thought tree atoms make trees, then wood atoms make wood? Well, he might have lumped that all together. <laughs> yeah. He says they're always moving. So think about it. He's out in nature. He's watching trees move, leaves move, rivers clouds flow, fly. clouds move. So he's saying, well, if those are made up of atoms, then atoms must move too. So you see how he's thinking? And they form different materials by joining together. So maybe he's like, you know, he's observing wood being burned, right? And he's like, this is wood atoms. But then at the end, it doesn't look like wood atoms. So he's... He says maybe the atoms join together to make something new. So he's putting fire, all this fire, stuff together. Wood make right, but what is he really getting at? Now we know. What is he talking Chemical about? Chemical changes. Yeah, and he's talking about compounds, which is amazing that he could come up with that. The fact that he's saying they're always moving, atoms do always move. And the funny thing is, atoms are mostly empty space. But if this is made out of atoms, why can't I get my hand through it if it's Not mostly empty space? Form? They're so tightly bound. They're so together. tight together. There's millions of layers of atoms just in this piece of paper. Millions of layers of atoms, right? But, you can't but you're like, if they're mostly empty space, I should be able to get my hand through it. Well, imagine this scenario. Okay, think of like a fan with fan blades, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not moving. I can get my hand through that those hand blades, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine the hand blades starting to spin really fast. Mm -hmm. And I do it again. Gonna Am I going to hit a fan blade? No, yeah. you're not gonna have a I'm probably going to hit a fan blade. Well, the fans I have, make, sometimes they have like plastic blades. Well, then you wouldn't be able to hit that. Yeah, well, the point is I can't get my hand through because the blades are moving so quickly that it's kind of like making a solid wall, right? Atoms, we kind of depict atoms as spheres, like solid spheres, right? But they really aren't. They're mostly empty space, and it has to do with the electrons moving so fast that every time I touch an atom, I hit an electron. I hit an electron. So it acts as a solid sphere. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, how do people punch through walls? <laughs> because it they're has to do with, atoms. you're you moving the force, and you're applying a force and you're moving matter out of like, you're the point the I'm trying to make here like. <laughs> is that for, the point that he said atoms are always moving. Well, first of all, he called it that he, 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 he said that things it. are made of atoms. That's pretty incredible that he just started thinking that. But then he said they're always moving. That's incredible. And now we know that yes, atoms are always moving. So if we can, we can't punch through like a piece of paper or like, or like uh, one of those things. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. How can, why are we able to punch through water or like liquids? Like okay. why is All right. That? Well, we're just, it's, they're easier to move out of the way. So you're oh, right. So the solid, the, the atoms are closer together, right? And for liquids, maybe they're a little further apart. Some of the bonds are broken so we can push them out of the way. Oh, okay. right. And for gases, I'm moving the atoms out of the way because they're not attached to each other, right? Here in a solid, the atoms are attached to each other. That's good. That's good. Your your brain's thinking. <laughs> You're thinking. Oh no, I was not wasting my hand. I was just okay. Thinking. Go ahead. No, so like the pad all together, you try to punch through it, but you can't do it. But if you have one piece of paper by itself, you can go through it and you can break it. So well, why can you break again, it? Again, you know, you have like it's millions. You might have millions of layers of atoms. You might have you know, um, trillions. trillions or billions, billions, you know, more Infinity. than billions, trillions, trillions are bigger than that. So the point is, Piper, you have a lot more layers of atoms, yeah. so it's just even harder. It's like taking a bunch of fan blades <laughs> and putting them all in a row. Like, you you're, should just try you can't, like, figure it out. All right, you guys all saw this in the video <laughs> of his depictions of, like, salt and Wait, iron. so you don't know which ones are salt and which ones are Not iron. really, but I just found that. Okay, so Aristotle, if you look at the time frame, you don't have to memorize dates, but you have to know order. So Democritus is older than Aristotle. And if you look at the um, time frame, um, I think Democritus dies around 370 BCE. Yeah, Bacar that's Bacar what you see in the video is 370. This one's 384. So we have an overlap of like 14 years. Um, so Aristotle's not standing up and preaching 
at the same time as Democritus. But once Democritus is gone and his his like theories are out there and Aristotle starts to rise in power. Aristotle was the student of Plato. Have you ever heard of Plato? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Plato... We talked about you know, Plato in English class. Yeah, he, he believed... Oh, yeah. His focus was figuring out the difference between real and ideal. I don't know. And Aristotle w took that on. And he wanted to know the difference between being and becoming. That's deep. Right? It's very deep and philosophical. I so that kind of leads you to how he came up with his theory. He wasn't like cold turkey. This is how it is. Atoms exist. You cut, 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 and you end up with a particle that you can't cut. He's more along the lines in Plato of, mm. well, could you really cut? What if this isn't, you know, real? Or, you know, like just starting to question it more. Aristotle had a lot of influence in society. He also studied law. Um, and so a lot of people listened to him and trusted him, and he got everyone to kind of change their viewpoint and believe that only four elements really existed, and the combination of those four elements gave you the diversity of life. Um, and the, the famous example was a wood burning in the, in the fireplace, and that piece of wood, you know, would burn with fire. You'd have smoke being given off, water would come out of that log, and then you'd end up with ash. If you look at a river, you know, the water's flowing and it's cold if you feel that river, right? And in combination with the earth. If you look at rain, things are left moist. So this is how he justified it. And people believed him. He said different combinations of this would give you different things in the, in the universe, right? And we know now that this is not true. We actually do believe in the atom and we have different kinds of atoms that give us different stuff in the universe, right? Question. Do you think that if Democritus was around the same time, or like Aristotle was old, older and was giving off his ideas of this when Democritus was still around, would Democritus, and Democritus was He'd there to, like, to defend his idea? Right. Would people stick with their belief in Democritus or change our You know, Aristotle? it was kind of a popularity contest too. Um, maybe, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about that. Maybe Aristotle had more influence. Doesn't matter if you can go on and on. But, but remember, Democritus, these are ideas, right? He didn't have research to back it up. So people don't know what to believe. So then it becomes a popularity contest, right? Yeah. So elements are all different kinds of atoms? Yes. So carbon is made up of carbon atoms. Okay. And sodium has unique sodium atoms. They're very unique. And you're going to learn about that. And then that those in the atoms section. are combined to make other things. Compounds, right? Yeah. Like sodium and chlorine can make a compound. Oh, so like okay. pictures we saw see when we like with the balls. Those three yep. balls are all the atoms yeah. of those elements. Right. Okay. All right. Let's talk okay. about something cool. Question. Um, like she was talking about how the compounds is like so an elements like you said carbon. It's yeah. made of carbon atoms. atoms. If you let's say you make salt, yeah. table salt, would it be one compound. kind of atom or two? no? It would be two atoms combined chemically. So it'd be an atom of sodium and an atom of chlorine. But it doesn't make a different atom, it just like... No, it makes a different compound. Okay. Two atoms together that are different, like sodium and chlorine, will make a compound. Okay. But if you have a sodium atom and a sodium atom, you don't make a compound, you just okay. have a lump of sodium. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk, let's, let's now, like if you look at a, a number line and you think of like the negative numbers on the number line, that's like BCE, right? That's like Aristotle yeah. Democritus. So if we go towards the positive end of the number line, past the zero mark, right? We're now advancing like 2,000 years. This is not in your notes, so you're going to want to write it down. Um, this is when alchemy was practiced. Have you ever heard of alchemy, yes. read The Alchemist? Or yes. There's a lot of books that kind of use the idea of alchemy. Is this just, are all these notes going to be about alchemy, or are they just about alchemy? Uh, there's a little bit about alchemy, and we're going to do John Dalton after that. So leave some space. All right, and all this stuff can be found in the book too. So make sure you bring your book home and you keep it open to give you an addition, additional information. So alchemy is super cool. It's, it's pseudoscience and pseudo means fake. So it's like fake science. So at this point in time, we're talking the 1600s, we're talking the, um, 1700s, medieval times, times where Chinese dynasties ruled and emperors. And China was more than just its boundaries. It was a lot more um, landmass, right? 
um, alchemy was being practiced. So if you think of wizardry, you think of like, you know, I don't know. Back in this time, scientists had to kind of go underground. Not like literally, but secretively. Because who do you think was running the show back then? The king. king people. The king and the church. Right. So, have you ever heard these stories about how the church would actually um, persecute or, or like even light different buildings on fire if they found out that you were doing science? Because what do you think that they associated science with? God. Not, well, not, not, that's, not, no, not, not believing in God. Not believing in God. Because they're believing, they believe in, in, like, they're the believing whole in their evolution facts and, instead of Yeah, but they didn't even know what evolution was yeah. back there. But they thought, they thought science was like the work of the devil. Oh. So they would kind of banish people that dabbled in science. So, you know, like Isaac Newton and uh, Galileo and Leonardo da Vinci and all these famous scientists... You know, back in the, you know, 1600s and all that, um, science wasn't looked at as being, you know, the way to get, find answers to life. They actually thought that it was kind of evil. And so people had to do things kind of behind closed doors. Yeah. But in Aristotle's and Democritus' time, that they, their, that time believed that science was a good thing. That wasn't. They didn't yeah. even have the word science back then. Well, they just were it observers. Wasn't frowned upon and they, it yet. wasn't frowned upon. They were just kind of like, you know, a very primitive society. We're talking togas and, you know, wood burning, you know, fire places in their stone place, you know, habitats. Yes. Uh, something popped up on your phone. Okay. It's probably all right. Um,. Okay, we're still good. All right, so I gotta tell you about this because it's really kind of cool. Um, alchemy was being practiced. And right now I want you to think of um, the Chinese empire. So have you heard of like dynasties, like family yeah. dynasties yeah. in China? Okay, so listen to this. So do you think that the Chinese um, emperors, do you think that they just wanted to do their little term? Like, you know, the president no. has terms of no. four years. No, they wanted and, to take over and, China. and do you think that they wanted to just like go, you know, did they, do you think they had elections? No. 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 And how do you think these dynasties lasted? It was a family. family. You had to be born into it and you just kind of continue to rule, right? Well, Chinese alchemists, Chinese alchemy, they had a, a, a vision, they had a, um, something to focus on. What do you think they were driven to do? The emperors hired Chinese alchemists to help them do what? Get people to- They like wanted them. to rule forever, so how could they do that? Oh, they wanted to live forever? Live forever, so yeah, they sought eternal life. Yep. Have you um, heard of the Fountain of Youth? Yes. Yeah live forever yeah it all kind of has to do with that all of that was was thought possible they wanted to continue to rule the land and they didn't want to die because that would mean like if they couldn't have children then their dynasty would die they would have no inherent you know um, generations after them so they would hire Chinese alchemists not hire they would order them to work under the emperor and they would say, you need to come up with a concoction, like a, something that I can take to help me live forever. And so these people would dabble with this and dabble with it, whatever they can get their hands on. And they would take notes and notebooks and this didn't work, this didn't work. And these guys would take things like, I'm assuming they're men, there could have been women too, but sulfur. They would take things like sulfur. Should we write all this And down? they would add it to other elements like let me tell you about sulfur first of all sulfur is used in gunpowder and actually the chinese were the first to figure out how to use sulfur to make gunpowder powder and then that's when wars started to get more you know chaotic but sulfur is going to be like the strip on a matchbox and then the match is phosphorus which is the next third neighbor to sulfur when you combine the two you get fire so sulfur, we've used it in the lab and it didn't smell that bad, but as soon as we heated it up and we combined it with iron, we got the pyrite and it got really smelly. They would take sulfur and they would mix it with this one. What's that? 
Mercury. Mercury. Magnesium. Mag That's an H. Mercury. 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 Right. Number mercury. 80. That was so they would mix it with mercury in a drink, mind you. Ooh. Mix it together, actually, and they would get a actually they would get a mineral out of it, and the mineral was cinnabar. Have you ever heard of cinnabar? Yeah. Nope. Mm -hmm. People so have it? people had cinnabar as their mineral last year. I don't know if only one person had it or multiple people had no, it. Anyway, it's like a red powdery mineral and they would mix it with water and they thought this would give me everlasting life. And they'd say, here emperor, here is your solution. And the emperor would say, great, you drink it. And so they would drink it and they would kill them instantly. Oh, they smart, the emperor. Yeah, right? So that's one thing. The Chinese alchemists believed in eternal youth. They wanted to live forever. So on a quiz, I would say, you know, which of the following uh, sought eternal life? And you'd say Chinese alchemists. Okay, Europeans focused on something totally different. What do you think they did? Um, um, taking over the world. Taking over the world? Close. Taking did they want to live forever? No. Yeah. Well, they were very greedy. They wanted to poison money. people. Not poison people. Money. They yeah. wanted money. So they sought wealth. So they, the kings, they would they would hire That's or tell order them. these European alchemists to make them wealthy. And what element do you think they wanted the most of? Gold. 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 And gold wasn't as plentiful, and we didn't have the technology to mine it in the out of the ground like we do now. Although it's still not plentiful and it takes a long time to actually get it out of the ground but they thought that they could take this lead, lead and change it into gold do you think it worked no. no if it did what would the world look like now beautiful it'd be gold it'd be we'd have all gold everywhere right because we could take lead which a lot of elements decay to lead a lot of elements de decay to lead so there's a lot of lead out there um especially in the ground and stuff if that was the case, we could change all that lead to gold. And then do you think gold would be worth as much? No. No. So that doesn't happen. But those are kind of cool stories about um, how um, alchemy was practiced. Now, this started a new revolution in science, and more and more people started to dabble in science. And it became that it wasn't scary to be associated with science. And actually, it was advancing society. So. Let's advance to the 1800s where we have John Dalton, who, Kyla, think he's kind of cute? No, I don't know. Cute. I just love it. I'm kind of the he spectacles. Like yeah, it looks like an owl. Yeah, Daphne thinks he's cute. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> he's got the beaver child. John oh, yeah. Dalton, 1808. <laughs> you don't have to memorize dates, but you got to know, like, we're now getting closer and closer to modern times. We have 1808. There's a lot of different people. Unfortunately, it's a lot of males. But women are there too, they just don't get recognized. Now they do. They but do. back in this time, women didn't get recognized because women weren't really allowed to do that kind of stuff. They took care of the home. John Dalton believed that tiny particles could not be divided. And he thought, so so who's, whose ideas did he believe in? Uh, Democritus. Democritus' ideas, right. He said that tiny particles could not be divided, meaning I'm gonna find an indivisible particle, right? Which means uncuttable. So he believed in the atom. He thought each element had its own kind of atom. A lot of different elements were being um, discovered at this time. In fact, um, Robert Boyle, do you remember that name? Boyle's, yeah, yeah. Boyle's, Boyle's Law. Law. So gas laws. So Robert Boyle was kind of like focused on uh, gases. He was. He was the one that discovered oxygen Ooh, that's and the way that he did it was he took a bell jar which was like a glass stone jar that I've used in yeah. class before and he put like a mouse in, underneath this bell jar and then he would remove all the air out of the bell jar and he would just watch and that mouse died and then he would repeat the experiment but in this time he would add air in fact he added oxygen and the mouse you know, was vivacious and running around. I thought you said. I thought you were gonna say it exploded. No, it didn't explode. I it came but back the to point life. he got from it. Fast forward a little bit. He discovered that oxygen will bring life, and it is an its element on, on its own. Um, so that happened. You see that 
different things were being discovered like silver, iron, carbon, sulfur, lead, gold. You don't have to um, do these symbols at all. But what do you notice? Um, uh, are any of them like the symbols on the periodic table now? One is. One is, which is? Carbon. Carbon, carbon right. So carbon still C, but the other ones have changed. And some of them even have like a symbol, like a plus sign. And why do you think they made the gold symbol like this? Because everybody wants it. It was like fancy special. and valuable. valuable and it's shiny, it kind of looks like a sun. Um. Like, like goals <laughs> rain down by the sun. <laughs> John Dalton didn't have any idea how big these atoms were um, or how they were constructed because the technology in the 1800s would not allow him to kind of figure this out. But he did, he is the one that started saying that these atoms can combine. So if you look at the primitive pictures, it's the one with the hooks, the one with the hooks. So he said that molecules are formed when we take elements and join them together, like with those hooks. So this is a great picture showing that. Molecules can form in whole number ratios, which means I have to have a whole atom of hydrogen and a whole atom of oxygen, not a half of an atom. So not like Elements hydrogen. cannot exist in half form. That's what he's saying, basically. Very simple. Don't look any further into it. Basically, he's saying that elements can combine to form a molecule like water, but you can't have half of an atom. So he's just laying it out like that. He came up with a number of theories that we actually can relate to current times now, which is amazing because it's in the 1800s and he's developing these theories of what he thinks uh, pertain to atoms and compounds, and they really are correct. There's a couple that we now know aren't totally correct because the technology is advanced and we've learned more. But I'm gonna give you two of his theories and we'll stop it there so you'll be even with the morning classes. Um, the first theory, don't draw this at all, but the first theory, here's the two theories. The first theory is that elements are composed of atoms. Do we now agree with that? Elements are composed of atoms? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So if I have an element of carbon it's made out of carbon atoms. He's just kind of stating it so we can all kind of agree and be on the same page. His second theory was atoms of different elements have different masses. You kind of know that because you kind of have an idea of the periodic table now. Hydrogen, is it a big atom or a small atom? Take a guess. It's number one. Small. 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 Gold is number 79. Is that big or small? Bigger. Bigger. And then the newest element that was created in the lab is number 117. That's even bigger, right? So they're numbered based on their size. Their proton size. number. Oh. Their proton number. And that, okay. that is a physical thing, Piper. So that's going to add to how heavy it is, right? Atoms of different elements have different masses. And that leads you to this picture. Don't draw this picture. But this just shows that hydrogen is number one. I mean, it has a weight of one. Carbon has a weight of six. But mercury has a weight of 167. So what he's trying to say is that atoms um, are unique to each element and they have different masses. Look at the symbol for hydrogen. It has a little dot. This one, azote, was an element. It was probably number five, which is boron, but then they renamed it. What's platinum? Platinum. platinum. Okay. So they okay. changed the name, platinum. So you see how they made symbols? Well, as time progressed, so they came up with charts first it wasn't until Dmitry Mendeleev came in and then he started making it look like a chart, like the current periodic table. And then they started changing the pictures to like a letter. Mm -hmm. And they based a lot of it off of Latin. Because we're just that cool. <laughs>